Welcome everyone. My name is Nicole Hemingway and I serve as interim CEO of the US Pain Foundation. We are so excited to have you all here with us this evening for a very informative webinar, Chronic Pain and COVID-19, Navigating the Unchartered Waters. Before I introduce our presenters this evening, I just wanted to go over our agenda very quickly and go over some housekeeping items, let you know sort of what's going to happen for the evening, and then also make sure that everyone um, is ready for this really interesting and exciting and informative webinar. So housekeeping items I will talk about, then turn it over to Dr. Bilski, who's gonna give a brief overview of challenges before introducing Dr. May. Dr. Bilski will then follow up and then I'm going to open it up and be moderating a Q&A discussion at the end. Some of the housekeeping items I wanted to talk about briefly were that all attendees are on mute with their cameras off. For those that aren't very familiar with Zoom, I want you to know that if you go down to your menu bar at the bottom and hover, there's a section that says Q&A. There you can type in your questions, but please know that we can't answer anything about personal medical questions or experiences. Um, I will be moderating those at the very end of the webinar, and then we will answer as many as we can, but please know that we might not be able to get to everyone's. Additionally, we know that Zoom and other platforms have been experiencing occasional glitches just due to the influx of people using these platforms right now. So if for any reason you get disconnected, please just rejoin and also know that a video recording will be available within 24 to 48 hours and posted on our website, uspainfoundation.org. So tonight, I have the distinct pleasure to introduce Drs. Edward Bilski and Megan May. Dr. Bilski is Provost Chief Academic Officer and Professor of Biomedical Sciences at Pacific Northwest University of Health Sciences. Dr. May is a professor at the University of New England in which Dr. Bilski will introduce her later on. We are honored to have both of them here this evening as we have been getting a lot of questions regarding COVID-19 and they are some amazing experts that can help us understand this time much better. Before I turn the reins over to Dr. Bilski, I did wanna share a disclosure statement for all of our presenters. And now Dr. Bilski, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Dr. Bilski, I believe you're still on mute. How's that? Perfect. Is that coming through and the slides are showing? They are, yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks uh, for hosting this. This is uh, you know, a real treat for us to, to be able to communicate to uh, this audience. And uh, the relationship with the US Pain Foundation goes back, I think, probably six, seven years when I met you first at a uh, national pain conference. And you were, I think, at that point, just starting to do the Invisible Project. It caught my attention because I was doing work with narrative medicine and uh, some of the testimonials we were doing at the University of New England uh, to raise awareness and, and hopefully advocate for better treatment uh, options and access to care for uh, people with chronic pain. Uh, so uh, it was a great relationship and uh, we hosted a number of your ambassadors, I think in 2016 on the University of New England campus. Uh, I moved to Pacific Northwest University uh, about three years ago, a little over three years ago and really enjoy it here too. It's also an osteopathic medical school and uh, growing health professions programs. Uh, special shout out to our continuing education team, Melissa Holm, and uh, the committee put together in record time a uh, review of the uh, program, and uh, we are going to be able to offer this for continuing education as well. So let's see if I can advance the slides. Uh, so quick general outline, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about COVID-19 and the media and, and where we should be able to get reliable sources of information and be cautious about uh, some of those other sources that you might be seeing. Uh, Megan is going to cover the virology and epidemiology. And then I'll uh, finish with some physiology, pharmacology, and some applications to medicine in particular uh, for people who have uh, chronic pain. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. So again, I've been uh, kind of captivated by this because of the impact it's having on our university and our community. And I'm not a virologist by training, so I needed to 
uh, get accurate information in terms of risk uh, to our student population and also to our employees and also how we can help out the uh, community. So uh, it's been a learning curve for me as well. Uh, one of our senior staff members sent me this uh, email a while back. Uh, it was a different take on the coronavirus and potential causes. And uh, this uh, physician uh, had made this claim through YouTube. First Facebook, which was taken off, thankfully, it's available on YouTube about uh, the possibility that 5G introduction in Wuhan was uh, the cause of this uh, virus. And this is you know, very important that uh, we as either medical professionals or scientists, we do have credibility with the public and we need to protect that integrity. Uh, there are these specious arguments that on the surface sound like, hey, that kind of makes sense. I could kind of understand that or that timing kind of uh, plays out here. And he talks about the 1918 pandemic and this was the introduction of radio waves uh, right around World War I when the uh, great influenza uh, started spreading. He talks about radar waves after World War II and another pandemic and satellites in the 1960s and a pandemic that coincided around that same time. And he's got a little bit of biology in there that you know, for someone who is not a virologist or a scientist, maybe saying, wow, that kind of makes sense. Maybe there's something to this. But if you start to look deeper into his arguments, you, you quickly find that there's a lot of false or misinterpreted information. And you know, we like to have uh, different points of view in science, we, we embrace that, but it's also important to properly vet that and make sure that when we make statements to the public, uh, that it's, it's educated and there are limitations to the things that we can tell you at different points in time as you know, a crisis like this kind of uh, evolves. So uh, just a note of caution. And uh, you know, when I look for resources, I try to get peer reviewed uh, medical literature that uh, has been vetted through a, a peer review process. And there's also other good sources, the CDC, uh, the National Library of Medicine, what we call PubMed. Uh, many of the reputable uh, science journals are making some of their content available for free. And some of that is uh, meant for the direct public consumption, uh, trying to avoid jargon and, and uh, overly technical explanations so that, uh, you know, the people who are not scientists can understand it and uh, can hopefully uh, use that information uh, to help you know, protect themselves and to uh, get the help they need and navigate this uh, successfully. So again, the, uh, some of your primary sources should be uh, the CDC, your uh, local health districts. Each county has a health district and a, a set of experts in uh, epidemiology and public health. They're tied to the local hospitals and healthcare systems. And your physicians and your other healthcare providers too should be staying up on the latest information and and hoping uh, to use that. Uh, Facebook is great for many things. Uh, I've got a lot of colleagues that are posting about this and keeping connected socially. Uh, this is one from Maine who uh, went out and got some essentials for her. It was uh, including ice cream from a local dairy. And uh, when she posted this, she had some interesting responses. And this was one of the other rumors going around that uh, cold things you know, really make the virus a lot worse and heat, if you drink tea or hot chocolate, it's gonna kill the virus and protect you. And, you know, fortunately, she, uh, even though she's a historian and a liberal arts kind of major, uh, she knew, you know, what was right and what was wrong and quickly tried to correct the, the individual that posted on her, uh, on her post. So uh, we need to make sure we get accurate information. You're also seeing a lot of data, a lot of statistics. Uh, some of it's uh, sensationalized and maybe we overdwell on it. Uh, but a lot of the messaging is important and, uh, you know, is going to help us uh, through this, even though it means uh, you know, some sacrifice right now. Uh, this is a, the classic one saying what we're trying to do in this second phase of mitigation is to kind of spread out uh, the number of cases so we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. And again, there's an overall capacity across the United States, but there's regional and local capacities that we've got to be uh, you know, tied into and making sure that we're not overwhelming. We certainly also want to protect uh, the workers who are on the front lines uh, with adequate uh, protective devices and you know, other critical equipment uh, to maintain people, particularly if they get very sick and have to go into the ICU, be put on ventilators. The things that you keep hearing about, please keep doing, uh, including you know, precautions, including disinfecting and social distancing. Uh, these stay-at-home orders need to be taken seriously. Uh, they are gonna help, they are helping. Uh, there's some really good data coming out of Washington State, for example, that uh, some of the things we put in place pretty early are uh, having a, a better outcome for the state than we might have anticipated otherwise. Uh, you're also seeing fluctuations in these rates, and this is another 
uh, classic uh, from the New York Times. Uh, this is an earlier set of data that shows a wide range of both how contagious this is and uh, the mortality rates uh, associated with it. Uh, the bottom line is it's worse than the seasonal flu, uh, both in the spread and also in the uh, uh, morbidity and the mortality of serious illness and death associated with it. Another take home is definitely the age-related uh, impact. Megan might talk about this some more too. Uh, certainly the, the risk factors include uh, advanced age, including in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. So those are special populations that are, look to be more susceptible to it. Overall fatality rate has fluctuated. These are calculated you know, essentially by taking the number of uh, deaths that are associated with the disease divided by the number of confirmed cases and multiplying that uh, to get a percentage. Um, and that, that rate has fluctuated. You've seen it kind of from a fairly high number, maybe six to 10% down uh, to lower numbers now. Uh, and that, that fluctuation is in part because of uh, where some of the first cases were, some of our earliest data. Uh, there was definitely some risk factors in Wuhan that may or may not be applicable to the United States. Uh, we also saw some of the death rates in the United States initially were skewed because of the uh, unfortunate uh, entrance of the virus into the uh, nursing facility that had a lot of older at-risk patients with comorbidities. And uh, so Yes, Dr. Bilski, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off really quickly. Um, are you still sharing your screen in presentation mode? I believe because so. It looks like you might have, I, it looks like you're the bigger picture instead of um, your screen. So I was just curious. So it says that my, let me try this one. Is that any different? Not quite, no. If it helps, it looks appropriate to me. Oh, um, good. But <laughs> yeah, it's showing on my screen as full. And Perfect. Now this, is the, this is the last graph before I introduce Megan. Uh, Great. You know, again, some of these estimates, um, when we previously looked at uh, the number of fatalities and then the number of confirmed cases, as we test more, the denominator is going to get bigger. And so that's going to drive down that, that rate. And, I think the United States is estimating around 3%. Megan may have uh, more up-to-date information than I do. Uh, I've heard as low as, uh, you know, 1.6% uh, or so in South Korea. Germany's maybe a little bit lower than that. So each country and how they respond and, and each community is going to be different, but there are going to be some risk factors that we'll talk about a little bit later uh, in the presentation. So that is, it's a great pleasure for me to involve Megan May in this. Uh, she's the virologist, infectious disease expert. Uh, I met her when uh, we recruited her to UNE in the biomedical science department. Uh, she hit the ground running, a, a talented researcher, but also I think very important is she has embraced uh, engagement with the public and also with some advocacy and some of her work with professional societies. Uh, you can follow her on Twitter. She's got a lot of followers and posts a lot of important information. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Megan. Sounds good. Okay. Let me see if I can correctly share my screen. Okay, oops. Share my screen, here we go. And hopefully we start that. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Looks All good, right. Emily. I guess yes, I'll just thank you. That to Ed and Nicole, because <laughs> I realize everyone else is muted. Okay, um, I want to start by thanking uh, Dr. Bilski for inviting me to participate in this webinar. One of the things that um, we like to do as scientists, especially when we start doing outreach, is that we have this habit of saying, well, you know, I may know more than the average person about X, Y, or Z, so. I can just cover that part of the talk. Whereas we now have come to realize if we pull in our colleagues that are more specialized, that it's actually a much richer experience for everybody who's participating in it, in particular the audience. So I'm really grateful that, that Ed reached out and, um, and asked me to cover this part of things. So I'm gonna talk a bit about what COVID-19 and specifically what SARS-CoV-2 are. And at the very end, I'll talk about who's at most risk, what particular populations. And that's a nice point, I think, to go back to um, the origins and the pitch of this talk, which is how does this affect chronic pain patients? 
Okay. So I want to start by talking a little bit about microbes in general and their life cycle. If I move my mouse, um, can uh, Nicole and Ed, can you tell me, can you see me moving that? I can see it move. Awesome. I'll use that. I like can a as well. Then. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll use that like a pointer. Um, one of the well, this is one of my very favorite slides to tar to start talking about the idea of an emerging pathogen. And the reason why it's one of my favorites is that we tend to have this image of an infectious agent as this brutal killer that is only out to get us and is just absolutely hell-bent on killing everything in its path. But that's not actually the case. And if we kind of revisit that framework, it helps us understand a little bit more about where they come from, how they got to where they are, and, and ultimately how to control them. Um, on the screen here, I have just schematic diagrams of, first of all, this is on a cartoon level what a human cell might look like. And then we have a whole bunch of different cell types for infectious agents. And you can see there's a whole bunch of different stuff in all of these. But they have one big thing in common, and that would be that they can all make us sick. But the other big thing that they have in common is that by and large, they share the same life goal. They're just trying to live their lives, right? I realized my drunk baby picture is, is behind a, a picture, uh, is behind Nicole's box there. But um, by and large, these guys are just trying to live their life. They find themselves in an environment and they have to survive. And in order to do that, they do what microbes always do. And in particular, we're gonna be talking about one of these guys today, an envelope virus. This does what envelope viruses do. It finds a host cell and it replicates itself. And in doing that, it can make you sick. And if it can't do that, it's going to die out, but it's going to try. All right, so when we start talking about virus and host interactions, we have to think about the critical pieces to that and the critical components. And by and large, the critical components are pegs and holes, right? It's a little more complicated than that, but like not a lot more complicated than that. Pegs and holes. The holes, think of these being receptors on the surface of one of our human cells. Think of the pegs as a protein sticking out of the surface of a virus. We would call that a ligand, but don't worry about that. Just think about it, pegs and holes. If you get round pegs and you have round holes, you get a productive interaction and that virus is going to be able to infect that cell and presumably then go on and replicate itself. If we scale that up, to think of it on a little bit more of a biological level, if we have a the surface of a cell and it's got all kinds of nooks and crannies and proteins and sugars sticking out of the top of it, but think of those again just as specific shapes of holes. And if we have a new virus and it can find that, that right hole, it's going to be able to bind on, fuse in if it's enveloped, and then start replicating itself. Now, if you have square pegs and round holes, absolutely nothing's going to happen. Think of it this way. If your dog has ever had kennel cough and they're not feeling well, they're hacking lungs up, and you're still, because they're your dog, you're hugging them, you're letting them kiss you, they're coughing on you, but you don't get sick. If you think about why that is, it's because you have round holes and the kennel cough virus has square pegs. That's it. Now, what can occasionally happen is that you can have new round, round pegs. They can be different colors, they can be different sizes, but they can still fit in the hole. And when that happens, even though they're not your co-evolved pegs, they can still make you sick. And that's the scenario we find ourselves in right now. We have round holes and SARS-CoV-2 has round pegs. All right, so what is this thing? What is COVID-19? 
COVID-19 is a disease state that's caused by this previously unknown virus, SARS-CoV-2. It's important because we hear both of those terms kicked around with equal measure. COVID-19 is the disease, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. Good parallel to think about would be AIDS is a disease, HIV is a virus. Same dynamic between those two terms. Okay, make sense? All right, so what is this thing in, in its entirety? This is a virus, and here's how it relates to other forms of life, right? So you have bacteria, you have archaea, you have eukaryotes, that's us, and over here you have viruses. What are these other terms that we sometimes hear kicked around for this, this, this entity? So just like any other biological agent, uh, SARS-CoV-2 has a system of higher groupings that it belongs to, so it's called its taxonomy. Um, I promise this matters and it's practical because you hear several of these words that you see on the slide kicked around to all sort of kind of refer to the same thing. So it's really critical to actually know what terms we're using and what they actually mean so that we can properly understand what we're discussing. Okay, so this is an RNA virus, so it belongs up here with ribo, uh, the ribovirulia. Here it's phyla and order and family and class. It's part of the coronaviruses. It's in the genus beta coronavirus, and it is itself called SARS-CoV-2, which is behind my picture. Sorry about that. Um, on the bottom, I wanted to also do the same sort of arrangement for another virus you may have heard of to give some sense of what are these things and how do these terms relate to each other, right? So down here with DNA viruses, you have orders, families, um, coming up through something called retroviruses, which you may have heard of, and lentiviruses, which you may have heard of, and then finally a virus itself that you certainly have heard of, HIV. If we look at SARS-CoV-2 itself, you've got the other species to whom it's most closely related, SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV, and several other minor benign human coronaviruses that cause sniffles. If we want to look at, um, you know, just the idea of any other viruses you may have heard of, they all kind of follow this same hierarchy, um, as do DNA viruses. So here are more you may have heard of. The reason, again, I wanted to point this out is that we've heard several terms and may still hear several terms on a daily basis to all refer to the current pandemic. Certainly you've heard COVID-19. Hopefully you now recognize that's the name of a disease, not a virus itself. You may have heard SARS-CoV-2. Ah, no, 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 sorry. Um, you may have heard SARS-CoV-2. That is the emerging virus. You may have just heard SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome. Um, that was the original name for a disease that occurred in 2003 that was caused by this cousin virus, SARS-CoV-1. They are very close relatives, but they are not the same virus. And then also the other one that you hear thrown around a lot, and this one's problematic, is the coronavirus pandemic. So what you can see here from this, this kind of hierarchy is here is our guy, and here is the term coronavirus. Way back up here, several taxa up the chain. The reason why I want to point this out is that when you hear or see or Google the term coronavirus, you may see things that apply to some of these other viruses down here. Oh, I lost my mouse, shoot. These other viruses down here, particularly these guys down here. If you see something about coronavirus that talks about mild cold-like illnesses, um, if you see on the side of a Lysol spray can that this has been demonstrated to kill coronavirus and you think to yourself, oh yeah, oh tell me this wasn't created in a lab, they've already tested Lysol against it. No, 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 no. They've tested Lysol against these guys down here who are also equally correctly called coronavirus. That makes sense? Here's hoping. I know taxonomy is a little weedy, but those little nuanced differences 
are what are going to help you be able to clarify for yourself some information that you're coming across. So hopefully that makes some sense. Okay, so where did this thing come from? SARS-CoV-2 is almost certainly what we call a zoonotic spillover event. This is when you have a virus that is co-evolved and adapted to live in a certain host species such that it doesn't do much damage to that host, same way with a rhinovirus does with us humans. It gives us sniffles, it's irritating, but it doesn't kill us. Um, it, it makes us sick enough to facilitate its own transmission and then it goes away. What happens when those little benign viruses that are co-adapted very nicely with one host jump into another one, most of the time, absolutely nothing is what happened. What happens because we've got a square peg round hole situation. However, if we have a new and brightly colored round hole peg and our same round hole, we can have a zoonotic spillover event. So we don't know what happened precisely with SARS-CoV-2 yet. We do know what happened with SARS-CoV-1 though, it's close cousin. So I'll show you a little bit about how that came into being. Some of these pictures sadly are gonna be uh, behind us, but what we now know happened was that SARS-CoV-1 was a virus that occurs naturally in bats. It doesn't seem to bother the bats in any way. You can swab it out of the nose of a perfectly healthy bat. Um, this seems to have jumped into what we call an incidental host. In the case of SARS-1, this was uh, something called a civet cat. And what happens, what happened then was that civet cats are a delicacy meat. They're taken live into uh, open air markets. And in, um, in, in this case, it was in Guangdong province in China. You can see it's circled on this map right here. Um, I believe these will be posted as PDFs after if anyone wants to see the full picture of this. And uh, these guys are also then slaughtered on site and sold as meat. So people come into the market, they buy this, they go home. And in the meantime, animals are exposed to other animals. The people doing the butchering are exposed to the, to the animals and their various blood, guts, and other ma uh, magical fluids. And then you have a whole bunch of crowded people all together. And so when you have a whole lot of spilling of fluids and viscera from different animals in such close-ish contact with people, there's the chance that something that didn't used to circulate in the human population now can. Um, this can happen in plenty of ways, but this is what happened with SARS-CoV-1. Again, we don't know yet know what happened with SARS-CoV-2. What we can say with a strong degree of certainty, not absolute, but strong, was that this likely is also a natural virus of bats. All of the members of its very close uh, cluster of viruses, its very closest relatives are all uh, viruses of bats. So it stands to reason this one is as well, but we don't know that for sure. Um, we certainly don't know if it went straight from bats to humans or if there was another incidental host in, in between. Um, and if there was, we certainly don't know what it is other than to say it was not pangolins. Please stop saying that. Um, so the only thing that we can say is that a paper has come out recently where people did experimental infections of dogs, pigs, chickens, ferrets, uh, and cats. And what's been seen is that dogs, even though they can become very transiently infected, they really are, are not, they don't get a lot of substantial replication. So it probably didn't come from a dog, it certainly didn't come from a pig. It does not seem to have come from a chicken because it can't replicate in those species. Um, however, it seems to really like infecting uh, ferrets and cats. So the thought might be, Perhaps something from that family could have served as a secondary host, but we don't know yet. Still looking and trying to figure it out. And sorry, in my SARS story, once this jumps into a human, if it's feasible to do so, it can then spread from human to human to human, which is of course where we find ourselves right now. 
Okay, so what is COVID-19 now that we have something of a handle on what SARS-CoV-2 is? So this is a respiratory tract infection. And it has, broadly speaking, three different presentations that we see. And we're still quibbling a little bit over what we call each of them, but by and large, think of these as the common presentation, the severe presentation, and the asymptomatic presentation. What we see for about 80% of people, and that's over all age ranges, as I'm sure uh, Dr. Vilsky is going to discuss further, it's a little disproportionate uh, where you see these different presentations per, by age group. So overall, about 80% of people see this as an influenza-like illness, which means you're quite sick for a couple of weeks. You're going to be in bed, you're going to have a fever, you're going to have a dry cough, you're going to have little to no appetite, you'll probably lose some weight, um, you'll have all the other fun things that come about with a nasty case of the flu, but in all probability, you will recover without medical intervention, right? So that's 80% of cases. Another small percentage, and we do not yet know what this percentage is because there hasn't been a widespread study to see all the people who were infected but never had any symptoms yet. That Those data don't exist, but we do know a certain proportion of people have an asymptomatic presentation. That means they are infected, the virus is replicating, but they have no symptoms at all. You could see why it would be hard at this stage of the pandemic to know exactly how many people that would be. Because if you think to yourself, maybe I had it, who knows? How would I know if I was asymptomatic? I'm not gonna go get tested, certainly. If not, and if I went and asked, they wouldn't do it. So, um, you could see why this would be a hard number to nail down right now, but we do know that this happens. Okay, the last presentation is a severe presentation. This has a very particular diagnostic feature to it, in addition to all the components of the common presentation, fever, dry cough, the aches, the, the tiredness, everything else. You have what is very clearly a presentation of bilateral viral pneumonia. You have fluid in the lungs, you have chest pain, you have shortness of breath. There's also a very characteristic uh, imaging feature for COVID-19 and it's something called a ground glass opacity. So there's a nice example right here on this slide. This is a CT scan. Um, so if you Think of this image as if you were looking at the top of someone's head and looking down through their body, and then that was kind of sliced into sections. That's what you'd be looking at. This is one lung, this is the other one, and this is their heart, and their, and their spine is here. Okay, so this is what we call a ground glass opacity. All of that white, cloudy, fuzzy stuff, that is a big, giant patch of inflammation and fluid in that person's lungs. And when you have all of that collection of inflammation and fluid, your lungs, of course, being the site where you do gas exchange, where you pull in oxygen, it gets into your cells, and then it spires out carbon dioxide and you breathe that out. The more goo and fluid are filling up your lungs, the less and less efficient your body is at doing that. And so, you end up having this feature of shortness of breath. And in addition to this, um, when you have all of this inflammation and fluid, it's very, very painful. That's why you have the chest pain. What we do for these patients are that these are the ones who tend to wind up needing oxygen therapy and winding up in the ICU. Okay. So what are the treatment options for COVID-19? What I am going to tell you is the best, the most current information that we have, regardless of what you perhaps may have heard in like some press briefings or something, um, if I may be polite about it. Supportive care is the, the best measure that can be done for these patients. That means fever control, that means fluid replacement. For a patient 
that is having uh, some wheezing and some additional inflammation, um, they can be treated with inhaled uh, vasodilators, so something like albuterol that are a nebulizer. Uh, a patient that's having a lot of shortness of breath with wheezing and uh, a couple of nebulizer treatments, it'll open them up and they may be fine then to go back home and continue recovering with just fever control. Uh, if that is insufficient and you have a patient who's getting into real severe respiratory distress, they may have to be intubated, uh, meaning their uh, scope in a tube goes down into their lungs and then they're hooked up to a ventilator and they have mechanical breathing happening to help them keep oxygenated while their body's fighting the virus off. If they are doing well enough and keeping their oxygen saturation up and they're starting to recover, they can then be extubated and have that pulled out. Um, over in the corner behind my picture is another, uh, is another image of something called ECMO, where this is a, a rather a step beyond intubation where you have the, both the heart and the lungs um, operating with reliance of, of um, external machines just to give them additional support while the patient themselves is trying to fight off and recover from the virus. Um, down here, in addition to supportive care, we've heard about some drug treatments. Um, we've heard a, a, about an anti-malarial drug or a, a class of anti-malarial drugs, uh, a, it, one particular antiviral drug, and then also something that I didn't put up here, but is, is certainly worth mentioning, and we can talk about in the Q&A if that would be helpful, uh, but that is passive transfer of, of uh, antibody from recovered patients. To go to the middle bullet here, uh, anti-malarial drugs, in particular uh, chloroquines, notably hydroxychloroquine. Uh, this has been touted as an effective treatment. However, uh, there have now been at least seven studies examining this. Two of them seemed to show some benefit. Um, they, had, uh, they had some particular design questions about them. Uh, however, the other studies did not show any benefit. They were completely equivocal. That, in other words, a patient had just as much likelihood of a recovery versus an adverse outcome whether they receive the drug or not. And so while we are still evaluating this, I, I in particular and several other people are at the very least hesitant to see this as a panacea. Um, and, in, and in addition to that, it's important to point out that these drugs, this drug class, but chloroquine in particular, have very, very, very harsh side effect profiles. And they're not something that one would envision being a great idea to give to a patient who is already cl critically ill. Um, so there's, there's not, um, it's not necessarily harmless to assume that administering these drugs to patients has no downside. It's still under evaluation. That being said, uh, there is one particular antiviral drug that's been evaluated in three or four studies that does look quite promising called remdesivir. A few other antivirals have also been evaluated, uh, in particular HIV-directed protease inhibitors and uh, hep C drugs such as sevospivir. Those do not seem to be particularly effective. However, remdesivir does look very promising. The hang up with that is that this compound is not FDA approved officially, although it has been given orphan drug status for, um, for compassionate use. And that being said, because it had not yet entered any clinical trials anywhere in the world, it's in relatively short supply at this moment. This was an early compound made by uh, Gideon Pharmaceuticals that hadn't yet been put through rigor rigorous clinical testing. So it does exist, it does work. However, the availability of it to simply call a pharmacy and have it actually there and available for patients is a, is a real hang up at this point. 
Okay, I want to say a few words about vaccine development. Um, this is something that has been discussed since very early on. And this is an exciting moment and something of a lucky stroke that this particular virus is such a close relative of SARS and MERS. And the reason for that is that the National Institutes for Allergy and Infectious Disease, um, perhaps you've seen their director on TV every day at press briefings, Tony Fauci, um, they have a, a very large, very well equipped and, and incredibly astute coronavirus research group. So they have one of the biggest critical masses of experts on this family of viruses in the world. So that worked out well. Uh, and one of the things that they do is try to work toward vaccine development. So I have a few images from some of their uh, MERS vaccine studies. What they did and the approach that they took was they took uh, a big chunk of what's called the spike protein. That is the peg of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and they made a few modifications to make it nice and stable and soluble and easy to produce and make it um, something that would be very shelf stable and hard for a vaccinated person's body to just degrade. I have a picture of it again, but it's behind our, our photos. Um, this is what the crystal structure of that, uh, of that peg looks like. See, this is our peg. Uh, they also crystallized what the, the human receptor would look like when it's stuck to it, that would be the hole. Um, and then what they did was they took this purified spike protein that they tweaked and modified a little bit, and they put it into a nice sterile formulation with some adjuvants, and then they used that to immunize, um, in the case of MERS, rodents, macaque monkeys, and um, uh, camels, which are the secondary host of, of MERS. And what they found was that this actually works beautifully well. Um, what you're looking at here, this block of pictures are from vaccinated animals. This block are from animals that were not vaccinated. And then all the animals were infected with, with MERS-CoV virus. Don't worry about any of this blobs. I just want to show you this right here and this right here. This is what normal healthy lung tissue looks like. It looks very lacy and it looks very delicate and it's very thin. When lungs get inflamed, um, such as during severe pneumonia, these nice little thin lace fragments get filled up with inflammatory cells and they swell up, swell up, swell up, swell up. And that's what you're seeing in this panel down here. So all of this tissue here, once looked like this when the animal was healthy. So this is what happens when you're infected with MERS. But this is what happens when you're infected with MERS, but you received that vaccine first. You're immune and it doesn't hurt you. Um, and this is just uh, showing that um, when you have vaccinated animals with these red bars here, you, and you put virus into them, these guys don't really have that virus take hold and start replicating, whereas uh, the animals that didn't receive a vaccine and were infected have lots of virus replicating. Those are the blue bars. So this vaccine that they developed for MERS works very, very well. And they did something similar with the spike protein from SARS, and it also works very well. And so the vaccine that you heard about that's now in trials, uh, this same group, made that same exact strategy with this new virus. And so the hope is what will happen is that if we are vaccinated and we then inhale SARS-CoV-2, our lungs will stay looking like this instead of looking like this. That's the idea. Uh, so as of right now, this is in phase one trials, meaning a suite of volunteers has been vaccinated and they're looking for the general safety. Of, of this, uh, meaning that it doesn't cause anaphylaxis or anything nasty like that upon injection. And so far, it looks very safe and well tolerated. Okay, so this is my last slide, I promise. Who gets which version of COVID-19? It's somewhat unclear, but here are the general trends. Pediatric patients, so 
children, particularly those under the age of 15, really do not seem to have a terrible time with this at all. They have minor symptoms, a few get somewhat severe symptoms, nearly every infected child walking planet Earth has recovered. That's terrific news. However, adults don't fare quite that well. What we see in particular is that older adults are extraordinarily susceptible to complications. That being said, we can see, and, and we've all, I think, heard about this on the news a little bit, severe disease in younger adults or middle-aged adults. This is fairly unusual, and we don't entirely understand if there's something different about those adults that get severely ill as opposed to one who doesn't. Uh, some theories that have swept around are um, changes in the, the um, cellular receptor, the whole, it's a protein called ACE2, which I believe Dr. Bills is gonna talk a little bit about. Um, the thought being they either have an unusual version that's extra sticky to, to SARS-CoV-2, or they maybe have more of it than an average person. Um, we don't understand yet why that is, but a lot of people are asking that question. One thing that we do understand for absolute certain is that the worst odds a person can have is if they're an older adult or if they have some chronic comorbidities. In particular, if you are an older adult, if you are an older adult who also has chronic comorbidities, you are um, you're likely to ex experience more likely to experience the uh, severe case of COVID-19 than an otherwise healthy younger adult. So hold the thought of chronic comorbidities. And I'm going to turn it at this point back to uh, Dr. Bilski. And at the end, I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you. Thanks, Megan. I'm going to try to uh, share my slides again. How's that looking? I'm not going to do video right now. So maybe that'll help with some of the people having a challenge seeing the slides. And, it's uh, working it's, perfect. Thank you. Excellent. And I've been trying to keep up with the questions and answers. I did defer a couple to Megan, and there's a couple new ones I haven't uh, responded to. So please keep the questions going, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get to some at the end of the uh, discussion, too. So uh, again, this question on vulnerability of patients uh, in chronic pain, we know, you know some of the risk factors. And uh, if you're an older adult, uh, it does appear that you uh, do have a higher risk of both uh, hospitalization, uh, significant uh, morbidity, uh, associated with the disease and also, unfortunately, increased mortality. Uh, so that's stratified in those graphs I showed previously. And uh, this is just a, a recent table uh, from the CDC, uh, and it, it kind of breaks it down by uh, the, the different uh, decades of your life, uh, 30 and over. Other uh, things, pre-existing conditions. So many uh, people with chronic pain uh, may have what we call these comorbidities, other diseases that are related to the pain or sometimes unrelated. Uh, they also frequently are immunocompromised for a variety of reasons. Either the disease itself that's causing the pain uh, might modify the immune system and the immune response. Uh, they may be taking drugs, uh, other types of pharmacological agents that may be uh, modifying and suppressing the immune system, and that puts them at increased risk. And then there's other treatments. Say if you are recovering from cancer and you might have gone through radiation uh, therapy, uh, that can also compromise your immune uh, system. So those all uh, unfortunately put you at higher risks of uh, many different infectious diseases, but in particular, we're concerned about COVID-19. Diabetes, heart disease, uh, there's uh, some uh, good information out now that I'm gonna show you in just a second. Uh, the two pictures I have up on the uh, right side of the slide, one of those is a um, patient advocacy group and I thought it was nice, uh, it's associated with uh, arthritis, including rheumatoid arthritis, and they uh, just had some simple uh, questions and answers uh, you know, for the public that you know, they wanna know, and uh, they're trying to get the best expert opinions uh, to, to answer those. So I give you the link uh, down below, the creakyjoints.org, uh, and that might be applicable for many different types of pain states where there's immune compromise. The uh, other one I wanna mention is the CDC uh, publishes this morbidity and mortality weekly report. It's not just about uh, COVID-19. There's many other um, issues of, of topical uh, currency, uh, but this one in particular struck me because it had some 
of the estimates of the prevalence of uh, these underlying health conditions in people and how they respond to the, uh, the virus and the disease. So this is just the quick summary of it. I've highlighted uh, the columns, the, those that are not hospitalized, those that are hospitalized but do not get admitted to the ICU, and then the ICU admissions. And if they have one or more of the conditions listed below, they significantly increase their risk of hospitalization and ICU admission, along with uh, significantly increased uh, mortality. So down at the bottom in the red box, I have if the baseline for if you had none of these pre-existing conditions. Of those um, uh, that were captured and adequately diagnosed, about 73% of them were not hospitalized. Uh, whereas the one or more of these comorbidities, you got about 27% not hospitalized. Conversely, those that have the comorbidities have a much higher incidence, 71 and 78% of the population hospitalized. And uh, then unfortunately, a lot of them are admitted to the ICU uh, predominantly. So summarizing that, among the COVID-19 patients with this, uh, where they have good medical records and complete information, they have estimated that 94% uh, of the deaths, uh, those patients had one or more of those pre-existing underlying conditions. And like I said, the hospitalization and admission to the ICU were much higher in these uh, groups too. So definitely want to use extreme caution uh, if uh, you fall under one of the more of those existing preconditions. We also have to consider besides biomedical, the biopsychosocial impacts that chronic pain have on people. And uh, we know uh, that uh, mental health can be impacted. The comorbidities with significant depression and anxiety that are frequently seen with people with chronic pain can further uh, you know, impair the immune system and, and your ability to fight uh, viruses. We also know that sleep is disrupted with chronic pain, and that's a stressor that can, again, impact the immune system and your ability to uh, you know, fight off the infection and get better. Uh, you may have mobility issues associated with your chronic pain, and this may uh, hinder your ability to get to a primary care physician or get help. You may also feel very socially isolated because of the chronic pain. And so that's a known risk factor too uh, for uh, overall mental health uh, care. Multiple medications, if you are on multiple medications, particularly drugs that affect the central nervous system, uh, those can cause side effects and that can also impact a um, you know, number of aspects of the disease and its management. So uh, it's a, you know, chronic pain is a very complex uh, you know, disorder and it's uh, because of that, it's a challenge both for the person that has it and for the uh, healthcare team that's trying to help uh, manage that. And then you add something like this on top of it, which is impacting our communities too. And I'll point out, this is a slide that David Tobin from the University of Washington presented. I liked it because I've heard a lot about the uh, ACEs or the adverse childhood events and trauma and the ex uh, impacts that that can have on, on people. It can increase uh, both PTSD and chronic pain. Uh, but there's many things in our communities and society that are impediments to uh, getting access to good care and to getting better. And we need to address those just as importantly. Um, so many different uh, types, I think, uh, that this uh, disease and the stay at home orders has really uh, made it challenging for people with chronic illnesses uh, to get to their primary care physician, to get to some of their other healthcare providers. Uh, this is something that David uh, presented in a webinar last week uh, to the UW uh, pain group. And he specifically mentions, you know, some of the non-opioid treatments that help benefits some people with chronic pain. Uh, that includes physical therapy, acupuncture, uh, behavioral therapy, uh, including uh, counseling, and uh, you know, some of the other things that you might engage in or try to engage in, including things like yoga. Those are probably severely curtailed uh, because of this, uh, the stay-at-home orders. And you know, there are opportunities. You gotta weigh the impact of your present condition and the risks to you and the community by going out and engaging the healthcare system in a traditional way right now. Uh, that's not to say if you have a medical emergency or it's, uh, you know, you've got a pain flare up and uh, you, know, you really benefit from a couple of these other therapies, uh, discuss it with your physician and with your other practitioners and, and make that judgment call on, you know, can you get to the office and can you get a treatment? If that's not possible, uh, there are a number of resources available on the web and, and 
know, the community is trying to respond uh, with, with help uh, in a variety of different ways, including, um, you know, counseling. Um, there's uh, various apps that are helping with, you know, trying to, uh, if you can tolerate some exercise or be socially connected with a group, uh, definitely take advantage of that. That helps with resilience and helps with uh, improving the, the conditions. Um, and then there's you know, other uh, things that are being made available too. I think, you know, one of the things that is really helpful is that both the federal and state government and the healthcare system is trying to adapt rapidly and, and make some exceptions. So telehealth is you know, something that you may or may not have engaged in previously. If you're from a rural community, maybe that's something that you're used to. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, previous to this all developing, uh, telehealth was maybe limited uh, for some people and they've, they've eased those restrictions. Uh, telehealth and telemedicine can provide uh, a lot of uh, aspects of care that might not otherwise be possible. And it does protect you and, and the community because uh, it doesn't require you to travel. Again, it's not a be all and end all, but it, it is something that um, might be useful. And uh, there's definitely you know, ways to protect your uh, confidentiality and your medical records and for physicians and other healthcare uh, practitioners to uh, share information and help with a treatment plan. Uh, prior to all this happening, Medicare only paid if you lived in a rural area and you'd have to go to an actual medical facility in your small community to connect with maybe a specialist in a larger community. Uh, but that has changed. There's been relaxation of those rules. So evaluation and management visits are now covered uh, by physicians and other healthcare uh, providers, including social workers and psychologists. Uh, this is now open service to any healthcare facility, including your own home. Uh, so you, know, you may have some trouble navigating that and hopefully you know, because you're tuning into this webinar, you've got good access, but some people may not have good internet access. So you know, try to reach out and uh, get an advocate that's gonna help coordinate uh, those services for you. Allow, uh, it also allows the healthcare professionals uh, from other states to meet uh, surge needs in communities. Washington State uh, relaxed those standards and brought some people in from other states and uh, waived their medical license to allow them to practice to meet the uh, uh, to demand. And uh, there's some other you know, uh, things on the insurance that uh, allows coverage. Uh, importantly to this uh, community, those of you who are on uh, opioids that uh, you know, benefit from that, uh, pharmacotherapy, the DEA has published some new guidelines and exceptions and allows practitioners and states uh, to be able to um, register in another state uh, so they can dispense. And uh, the controlled substances can be issued now via telemedicine, does not require that in-person medical evaluation uh, for the time being to address this. And the DEA, uh, again, is not requiring the the, uh, some of this to be conducted in person uh, with the medical evaluation. So switching gears, I like a little bit of history because uh, uh, some of the, the new drugs that are uh, being touted as potential uh, treatments uh, go back uh, centuries. Uh, uh, Thomas Sydenham uh, was a, a physician that was basically um, led to the, the modern revolutions of epidemiology and, and clinical medicine, applying scientific knowledge and practice at the time. Uh, and, and some of his work was influential for hundreds of years after. Uh, but he recognized uh, some of the uh, properties, therapeutic properties of this bark extract from South America uh, that would uh, reduce uh, chills and fever. And uh, it was starting to be applied to malaria, which was uh, more common in parts of Europe and Africa. So it was, you know, this extract was the primary treatment for malaria well into the uh, 20th century. And there were some analogs of that uh, that are chloroquine and uh, hydroxychloroquine that have made a recent interest with the COVID-19. So pretty structurally similar, and the pharmacology is fairly similar. The uh, newer drugs, the hydroxychloroquine, for example, is uh, improved in its pharmacokinetics and safety over the original extract uh, that was from the uh, bark of the, uh, the, of the tree. And uh, it, it's interesting that this is a, a World Health Organization essential medicine. It is in the top 300 of prescribed drugs. It's about 128, I think, was the 2017 ranking. Uh, it's been the primary treatment for malaria, but other uh, diseases too, including lupus, uh, which is important for the pain population. It can produce significant side effects. As Megan said, uh, one of those concerns is with what we call QT prolongation. Uh, it involves the heart and its uh, contraction relaxation cycling, uh, and that can cause arrhythmias uh, that can be very serious and lead to 
uh, death. So, you know, what's interesting about this uh, set of drugs is that they seem to have some antiviral properties. Uh, the SARS-CoV, the first virus that was uh, categorized in 2004, 2005, uh, demonstrated in vitro or in the test tube uh, some antiviral uh, properties. Uh, ongoing preclinical studies have looked at it now with SARS-CoV-2. And you know, again, I will highlight that there are major differences between what might happen in a test tube or a mouse or rat model versus bringing it into a much more complex human being. And we also have to be very concerned about not just the efficacy, but the toxicity, safety of, the, uh, of any of these drugs. Fortunately, the, these drugs in particular have been in humans previously and can be used successfully uh, you know, for malaria and for other conditions, but they are not without their side effects. And that's where we're trying to find the balance. And we also have to determine, are they protective and are they helping with the uh, course of the disease and, and reducing some of the symptoms leading to faster recoveries? So that, that is an open question. Uh, at the same time, you're seeing, you know, not just toilet paper, but other things bought up in large supplies. And that's depriving some people or making people concerned if they are on this drug already for, say, lupus, uh, having access to this. Because these are life-saving drugs uh, for these patient populations. And if everything gets diverted quickly and we don't even know the efficacy or the safety in this other patient population, this could have a really detrimental effect on certain people with chronic pain. And this is all playing out. This is from today. Uh, it's either CNN or CBS, I think, CBS on this slide. And, uh, you know, we, we are seeing a, a conflict between public policy and uh, uh, politics versus science and public health. And, you know, I don't want to get overly political on this, but let's just say that, you know, science and physicians and other healthcare providers are the experts when it comes to dealing with situations like this. And they are uh, more conservative in making claims uh, because there is a process to be followed to ensure that you know, we get access to medicines that are gonna help us, but they're not gonna hurt us through toxicity. And they certainly, we don't want them to be ineffective and then widely spread. Um, so Megan mentioned there's been several small studies. Most of them have not been well controlled. Uh, this is the first study that I've seen. Uh, it's also small, but it was randomized. They randomized patients um, as they uh, came into the hospital with the COVID-19 uh, diagnosis and uh, were seeing some of the, the symptoms. And that randomization is an important step in uh, controlling for various biases that could lead to uh, incorrect interpretation of results. And so what they found, the big take home message was despite some reported antiviral activity of chloroquine against COVID-19 in the test tube, we found no evidence of a strong antiviral activity or a clinical benefit of the combination of hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin, which is an antibiotic for the treatment of our hospitalized patients with severe COVID. Again, this is a preliminary study. It's a small study under, uh, you know, populated. Um, we see a number of more robust studies being enrolled right now and getting the information out as quickly as possible. Uh, so that may change, but right now there's not good evidence to suggest that this drug is effective um, in this particular population. Another one that I know that you guys are interested in is some of the concerns with ibuprofen and some of the other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin. And is this safe if I'm already using it? Uh, can I stay on it to manage my pain? Or if something happens and I need to use ibuprofen, am I putting myself at increased risk? Um, some of this came out of some initial cases that were observed by a physician in France. And then there was some public uh, social media that kind of caught our attention too, particularly if it involves kids. It, it, you know, our kind of uh, radar goes way up and, and a heightened sense of alert. Uh, so the, this was in Britain, a four-year-old um, was reported to have their symptoms worse after taking ibuprofen. Again, you don't have a control there to say, you know, if the person didn't get ibuprofen, would they have had a similar, uh, you know, uh, set or uh, pro uh, progression of the disease or not? That's why you need these controls to be able to make these uh, questions. So uh, France and then I think the World Health Organization temporarily uh, had some cautions uh, in saying that acetaminophen, Tylenol was maybe a better choice if you had a fever or you had some aches and pains. Uh, but that's been reversed. And right now, the FDA 
uh, is advising the patients uh, with this uh, uh, came out on March 19th. I haven't seen anything further on it. Uh, they are aware of the reports early. They did not find scientific evidence to support this claim. And so they're, they're taking uh, the approach that, you know, again, you have other treatment options if possible other than NSAIDs, but um, right now we're not seeing uh, evidence to suggest that we put a warning uh, with ibuprofen. Uh, again, all this is subject to change. If there's uh, additional studies or retrospective data sets that you know, would indicate that this was putting at risk, there is a, a possible biological explanation. But again, what happens in the test tube is, is very different than what happens in humans. So um, you know, keep monitoring that. Uh, this also is having effects on our society though. So there's even Tylenol shortages right now. And this ties back to India where they, a lot of the, the uh, drugs are made, the uh, uh, generic uh, equivalents, and then they're packaged and distributed across the world. Um, and there's some concerns that there's shortages of paracetamol or acetaminophen, Tylenol. So that's uh, my last slide. I'm gonna stop sharing the slides and go back to uh, sharing the video. I think Megan and Nicole are gonna join us and see if there's uh, questions that we can answer. And Yes, thank you both so very much. That has been extremely helpful. And I think it's a lot of good information. I think it's also been a lot for some people to fully digest. And so we greatly appreciate it, you making it a little bit easier for us to understand what is occurring right now in these unprecedented and really challenging times. Um, to all the attendees before we start, uh, this is our first Zoom webinar that U.S. Pain Foundation has actually hosted. And so we are still working out the kinks. I greatly appreciate so many of you saying you couldn't see things and we are sorry for that part. But um, I know that through it all, we all got through it and we were able to see the slides. Um, and so we just thank you both doctors, Bill CMA, for your time today. You also have been really great at answering some of the questions as they have come, but we do have a few more that I wanted to ask you guys both right now. Um, one was sort of on telehealth, and Dr. Bilski, I'll turn this one to you first. Um, one attendee was asking, when did the standard change in being able to access telehealth? Because some people are still having a difficult time in their own communities having their providers. Um, offer that as an opportunity to um, continue their care without going into a, um, a hospital or, or a doctor setting. Sure. So my understanding from Dr. Tobin's presentation, which I saw last week, uh, was this was taking effect uh, early March. And, you know, I believe that's at the federal level. So it's, you know, all the states. Having said that, I know there's uh, bureaucracy and, and sometimes challenges in getting a large system with a lot of inertia to quickly make you know, a radical change like this. Uh, we've had discussions at the university in terms of our employees and our students having access to a variety of health uh, benefits and services in this you know, very changed landscape, uh, uh, which is gonna have to rely on some telemedicine, telehealth. And we had to call our, our uh, insurance provider and kind of you know, have some deep discussions saying, you know, this is what we need and, and how is this gonna happen and we, we navigated, but we had some experts who were working on that in our human resources department. So I think it's, it's very challenging for an individual um, to be able to navigate this. Um, I will talk to Dr. Tobin. I got permission to use some of his slides and he may be willing to specifically do another webinar for this group. Uh, he comes from a primary care background. So I think you'd be really good to tap into his knowledge and, and some of the things he's done in Washington to help. We, we would love that. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question was on immunosuppressants for certain pathologies, and if that puts you at risk of getting COVID-19, and would it be best, and, and this is probably maybe more than you can answer, um, just because we can't give out medical advice, sure. but um, they, were, they were just wondering if there were any concerns about those types. Um, right, so in, in general, and again, in general, not specific advice, um, the thought is that biologics, um, so immunosuppressives, something like Humira, uh, that, that are, are going to, um, on a general level, depress your, um, your ability to go from an inflammatory response to a much more coordinated, uh, in this case, autoimmune response. Um, the thought would be that 
you're usually going to be at higher risk for acquiring infections in general. And but that being said, given that um, if you get to a point of being severely ill, um, the, uh, a lot of the severe illness that happens is because you have an unregulated inflammatory response in the lung. And so I've actually kind of done back of the envelope thought exercises with myself about, you know, it's funny, a patient on a biologic would almost certainly be more likely to be infected, but maybe they'd be more likely to be asymptomatic. <laughs> so, so it's, um, it's the kind of situation where it's certainly worth having a conversation with, with your physician about, um, because you are going to be at higher risk for contracting the disease. But that being said, if you have a, a condition where, you know, it's absolutely debilitating to not be taking them, um, or certainly in the case of if you have, um, you know, a lupus patient who's on an immunosuppressive, bringing them up, of course, now in a different context than, than, than Ed did, um, you know, you can have, if their disease was controlled and then it stops being controlled, it can be hard to get back under control uh, if you go on and off meds too many times, and then that can be, you know, progressively life-threatening. So it's definitely a nuanced conversation to have with the physician because it's going to depend greatly on the autoimmune condition in question. Right, right. One question that has come up too is if it's possible, Dr. Bilski, um, to sort of talk about some of those other symptoms that are reported with COVID-19, maybe the GI symptoms, um, uh, is eye pain part of that? Um, sort of what are those other symptoms that people should really pay attention to versus um, it, could, it doesn't really have anything significant to do with COVID-19? Yeah, I'm gonna probably defer mostly to Megan on this, but I'd say I've been reading the same reports and this is changing rapidly as we get more experience with it. Uh, certainly, you know, the virus, uh, typically uh, predominates in the respiratory tract, and that's where the concern, but there's reports definitely the heart and the cardiovascular system, the GI. I've heard some reports about loss of sense of smell as a potential warning sign. Um, you know, this is new for us, even though we, we know something about coronaviruses and we know something about SARS, uh, there's always gonna be new things to learn when you have a, a unique you know, virus that is just making its rounds in an entire population that has no immunity to it. So uh, we're, we're all learning at the same time, unfortunately, and uh, trying to do the best we can for recommendations. Yeah, one, one thing in particular we can say about the GI symptoms is that um, coronaviruses, and again, we're speaking now about that whole group of them, it's not unusual to see them replicating in the GI tract as well as in the respiratory tract. Um, from a, from a tissue standpoint, we think of those things as wildly unrelated, right? Your, your lungs versus your intestinal tract, but the, the surface of those tissues are actually very, very similar. They're both what we'd call ciliated epithelia. And they, so they can actually have some of the same types of um, holes, if you like, to, to go back to that analogy. And we know that uh, SARS-CoV-1 certainly um, in, in many patients was spreading through the GI tract as well as the respiratory tract. And that's one of the reasons why it was so explosively contagious because you had um, aerosol and fomite transmission, mm -hmm. and then you also had fecal oral transmission. Um, and we have now seen, I think there've been five case reports of detection of SARS-CoV-2 from a rectal swab. And so we have historical reason to suspect and some direct evidence that this does also replicate in the GI tract as well as the respiratory tract, which could certainly explain why people are having some GI symptoms. Um, we also have at least one case report of um, this virus replicating in a patient who was having 
So we mentioned um, some patients having eye pain. Uh, there was mm -hmm. at least one case report of a pretty severe um, conjunctivitis, and then virus was detected on the conjunctiva of that patient's eye. And so there did seem to be some direct replication going on there. And with regard to loss of sense of smell, now we're getting like really speculative, mind you, but um, there's also been a couple of papers, uh, one kind of hypothesizing that this could invade and replicate in the central nervous system. And then I believe one direct detection. So this is a virus that, again, we primarily see in the respiratory tract, but some of these other clinical signs, there's, there's some reason to suspect that there may be direct impacts of that virus on those other tissues. Um, how frequently they happen, how severe they are, and how long they might persist, no idea. But um, there, there, are, there is some direct evidence that these, this virus can replicate in all these other places and give you some clinical signs. That's, that's really good information to have. Thank you. Uh, another question that we have, have gotten a couple of times is, um, why specifically are those with diabetes more at risk? Yeah, I think, you know, both cardiovascular, you know, and diabetes that affects the cardiovascular system, uh, you now add on, you know, an additional viral load and a revved up immune system. And, mm -hmm. and the immune system is trying to fight this very careful battle, right? It's trying to be selective and appropriate in its response to a, what we call a xenobiotic or foreign substance, the virus in this case. But it's mounting not just localized, but more systemic, widespread uh, type of uh, responses. And this can, if you already have a compromised system because of this, these pre-existing health conditions, um, it can you know, go overload and, and be you know, very devastating to the, you know, that individual. So I, I, you know, I think uh, it's the same thing with aging. You know, as we age, uh, you know, unfortunately, our, our, our body starts to break down in certain areas and it's not uh, like it was when it was 18 or 20. Uh, so, um, yeah, we feel that every day when we wake up now, Nicole. I think we're in our, I'm in my 50s. I don't know about Nicole. She's probably 30 still. Uh, Barely, but, you know, but there's, yes. There's a wear and tear and, uh, you know, just our, our body systems, you know, when, when you have a, a couple more hits to it, um, you know, unfortunately uh, does not have the resiliency that it, that it needs. Yeah, and I would just add to that, um, when, we, when we see these severe cases, um, you know, that 20% that wind up in the ICU, um, the entire process of how that uh, unfolds is not spectacularly well plotted out at this point. But the one thing that is becoming clearer and clearer is that you have a, a component of wildly uncontrolled inflammation that's mm -hmm. really creating that bad clinical state we have this tendency as humans to think of our immune system as inherently good, and it is, it's fantastic. Um, but we also have to recognize that when we feel sick, we feel sick because of an immune response. That's what's making us feel so lousy and giving us fevers and giving us aches, pains, and just run down yucky feelings. And if you get an inflammatory response, that your body can no longer ramp down and control, you're really going to end up with a lot of damage to your tissues and ultimately you can have fatal damage to your tissues. And so if you look at a patient like a type two diabetic, they already have fairly dysregulated inflammatory responses. And so they're not, they're, their inflammatory system and their, sorry, their immune system and their inflammatory responses are already kind of out of whack and they don't always respond to signals as appropriately as they should. And then when you put on top of this, this virus that really seems to be extra good at causing a big giant brush fire of inflammation and then doing so in a way that your body has a hard time calming down if it gets past a certain point, it, to me, it seems almost intuitive that a, a diabetic is going to be far more sensitive to that or anybody else has got a chronic inflammatory 
um, disease because they're already primed to respond much more aggressively. And so that that's a little bit speculative, but it, it makes some intuitive sense to me that that, that would be a problem. That's interesting. That's, um, and I just think I'm looking at these questions and the ones that we've answered already. And um, I just want to say how much we appreciate your time and your expertise today. We have quite a few comments just saying that they truly appreciate this presentation. The slideshow was excellent. Um, we have some that say that they are a chronic pain patient as well as a healthcare professional and found this to be so helpful for them on both sides of what they're doing. So um, I know that there are some more questions, but unfortunately we are over on time and I do wanna be mindful of everybody, especially on the East Coast. Um, so I am going to quickly wrap up. Um, really quickly, I'm gonna share my screen one more time. Nicole, are we gonna be able to preserve the questions and, and some of the answers? I'm trying to respond as quick as I can. Yes, and I will keep the, um, I will turn off the recording, but continue with the meeting. So if anyone does have a couple of questions and if you still wanted to respond, then we can continue with that right now. But just some background or some more information about US Pain Foundation. We do have an information center on our website with all things related to COVID-19 that we are updating as much as we possibly can. If you're interested in more information, please go and visit uspainfoundation.org backslash COVID-19. We also put out a survey um, on pain care and COVID-19 and anybody who is interested in participating in it, it will be open until tomorrow afternoon. You can find the survey by going to bit.ly backslash COVID pain survey. And then finally, just one more time, thank you so much to Dr. Bilski and Dr. May. Um, this has been such an informative night for us. And I think that this is information that everyone is looking for. And we know that it is constantly changing. We know that you both are greatly busy at this moment. Um, so we appreciate you re and really truly are honored to have you as um, our presenters this evening. I also wanted to give um, a shout out and a big thanks to the Pacific Northwest University of Health Sciences for offering this as the CME. And I am gonna ask Dr. Bilski um, just to share any information for those medical professionals that might um, be interested in, in getting the accreditation, what next steps they should take for the survey. Oh yeah, so if, if you are getting uh, continuing education credits, uh, I think uh, either shoot me an email or Melissa home. We can provide uh, that email address. Maybe go through Nicole and she can give that to you. I did yes. send Nicole some information from the University of Washington that might be helpful. We'll see if we can get that uh, distributed out. And uh, I think I've shared my email. I don't know if Megan's willing to share hers. So if, if there's some follow-ups, uh, you know, this certainly sure. is not the first and, and won't be the last uh, that we'll work with the U.S. Pain Foundation. Well, thank you all so very much. I am going to turn off the recording right now, but we will keep it live just a little bit longer. I know, Dr. May, you need to head out. So thank you very much. Enjoy your evenings, it's everyone. Time here on the East Coast. So. <laughs> I understand. Thanks, everybody. Yes, and everyone, please stay safe. <laughs>